now. All right, please go ahead. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction and uh, thank you to all the organizers for giving me this opportunity to present. So in case you missed it, um, as it was said in the introduction, I'll be presenting um, measurement of low energy resonances in the oxygen 18 alpha gamma reaction. So um, I'll begin with the motivation and this will include a general introduction to and broad overview of nuclear astrophysics. Then I'll transition to the slow neutron capture process and the reaction that this presentation focuses on, which is the oxygen 18 alpha gamma reaction and measuring res the resonance strengths of the astrophysically relevant resonances. Once I've discussed what I want to measure, I'll introduce the facility and technique that I use to measure the resonance strengths, which means there will be a discussion of SURF, CASPAR, and Hector. I'll then share with you some results of resonance strength measurements from this experiment and end with conclusions. So one of the goals in nuclear astrophysics is to explain the origin of the elements. And part of that goal means understanding the solar system abundance pattern shown here. So we know that Big Bang nucleosynthesis produced mostly hydrogen and helium and a small amount of lithium-7. And then cosmic ray spallation is believed to be responsible for uh, lithium-6, beryllium-9, boron-10, and boron-11. Nuclear fusion inside of stars and nuclear statistical equilibrium is responsible for nuclides from mass 12 up to the iron peak. And then beyond the iron peak, the Coulomb barrier is insurmountably large and fusion is endothermic. And so nucleosynthesis beyond the iron peak instead proceeds with a gamma induced process and two neutron induced processes. The uh, gamma induced process is called the gamma process and the two neutron induced processes are the slow neutron capture process or S process and the rapid neutron capture process or R process. So this shows um, a schematic illustration of the operation of those three processes in just a region of the chart of the nuclides. So in the S process, you know, an unstable nuclide produced from neutron capture will undergo beta decay before capturing another neutron. And therefore the path of the S process proceeds close to the valley of stability. In the R process, a nucleus captures many neutrons and travels far from the valley of stability. And then when the neutron flux ends, whatever is produced along the R process path will beta decay back to the valley of stability. And then finally, there's the uh, gamma process, which is a complex series of photo disintegration reactions like gamma N, gamma P, and gamma alpha, and is responsible for producing 35 neutron deficient nuclides. So uh, going back to the solar system abundance pattern, you can decompose this portion of the abundance pattern into those three processes. And that's what that decomposition looks like. And I'm going to focus on the S process, which is the abundance pattern in cyan. And uh, models indicate that the S process can be divided into two subcomponents, a weak component responsible for this portion of the abundance pattern, and then a main component responsible for this portion of the abundance pattern. So the weak S process is responsible for mass numbers less than 90 of the S process abundance pattern, while the main S process is responsible for mass numbers from 90 to 205. And the average number of neutrons captured per C nucleus is around three for the weak S process and around 10 for the main S process. 
And they also differ in the fraction of C nuclei subjected to the neutron exposure. So it's unlikely that these different neutron exposures can be obtained in a single astrophysical site. Uh, it's more reasonable to assume that different sites are required to explain each of the S process components. So the weak S process is believed to occur in the core helium burning uh, in massive stars with uh, mass greater than 13 solar masses. And during the helium burning stage of these massive stars, the temperature is high enough to start the reaction change shown here on nitrogen 14 left over from the CNO cycle. And toward the end of this stage, the temperature becomes high enough to fuel neon 22 alpha N with this neutron being one of the neutron sources for the S process. The main S process is believed to occur in thermally pulsing low mass AGB stars. And so protons from the outer envelope of the star mix into the helium carbon intershell. This triggers the reaction chain on carbon 12, which creates pockets of carbon 13 and nitrogen 14. Carb uh, the carbon 13 pocket is then consumed by the carbon 13 alpha N reaction, producing the majority of the neutron flux. Meanwhile, the nitrogen 14 pocket remains inactive until a thermal pulse occurs, burning the helium in the helium carbon intershell and raising the temperature within. And then the elevated temperature allows the reaction chain starting with nitrogen 14 to occur with again, this neutron here being one of the neutron sources for the S process. So um, let's take a look at that reaction chain starting with nitrogen 14 more closely. Again, um, nitrogen 14 undergoes an alpha gamma reaction to make fluorine 18, fluorine 18, then beta decays to oxygen 18. Oxygen 18 undergoes an alpha gamma reaction to make neon 22. And then finally, neon 22 undergoes an alpha N reaction to make magnesium 25. And it's this neutron that's one of the neutron sources for the S process. A complete understanding of the nuclear reactions in this chain is necessary to fully characterize one of the neutron sources for the S process. And among those reactions, one of the least well studied is oxygen 18 alpha gamma. This is how neon 22 is produced. So fully understanding it is critical to understanding the neutron flux from thermal pulses and from within helium burning cores of high mass stars. And for that reason, I performed an experiment to study the oxygen 18 alpha gamma reaction. Now, at this point, it's instructive uh, to look at the previous measurements of this reaction, since it shows where my measurement fits in, and I'll be comparing my results to these measurements. So the first measurement of the oxygen 18 alpha gamma reaction was performed by Adams and co-authors in 1969. They measured the excitation function of this reaction over the alpha particle energy range of 2.15 to 3.7 MeV. Uh, gamma rays from the reaction were detected with a sodium iodide detector. And the distance between the detector and the target ranged from 12 to 24 centimeters. So here's the excitation function from that work, showing the data points ranging from 2.15 to 3.7 MeV. Now the Q value for the oxygen 18 alpha N reaction is about negative 697 keV. And so this means that for alpha particle energies above 852 keV, the threshold energy, the neutron exit channel is open and there will be a background of neutrons from this reaction. And so they overcame this challenge by using the time of flight between the detector and the target to separate neutrons from gamma rays. You can see this here in the lower right the first figure is the time of flight spectrum for all events detected in the sodium iodide crystal. 
can see the number of neutrons detected was far greater than the number of gamma rays. The second figure is gated on events corresponding to gamma rays in just a certain energy range, and they're able to clearly distinguish um, the neutrons uh, and gamma rays. Trott, Vetter, and co-authors studied the oxygen 18 alpha gamma reaction over the um, alpha particle energy range from about 0.6 to 2.3 MeV. So they pushed lower in energy. They used uh, jelly detectors and tantalum pentoxide targets. And you can see a diagram of the experimental setup here. The beam is traveling in this direction. The jelly detector is over here surrounded by a lead shield with a liquid nitrogen cold trap in front. They calculated the stellar reaction rate, which includes contributions of resonances from their measurement, the results of atoms and co-authors, so the work on the previous slide, uh, the direct capture process, which is this line, and the wings of a broad resonance shown here at 1.53 MeV. So thinking in terms of temperature, the reaction rate is well determined by the experimental data from 0.3 to 4.3 gigakelvin. However, and this is important, they noted that at relevant S process temperatures, so about less than 0.3 gigakelvin, the rate might be significantly enhanced if additional resonances could be detected at uh, below alpha particle energies of 0.6 MeV. So building off of that, Giesen and co-authors went looking for possible lower energy resonances. And they used the oxygen 18 lithium 6D and oxygen 18 lithium 7T alpha particle transfer reactions to study the level structure of neon 22 in the excitation range from 8.5 to 11.3 MeV. Four states were observed in that experiment at 9.72, 9.85, 10.05, and 10.13 MeV, corresponding to resonances at alpha particle energies of 58, 218, 470, and 566 keV in the oxygen 18 alpha gamma reaction. And you can see uh, that in these two figures below. So on the left, is a spectrum of the oxygen 18 lithium 7T reaction at 16 MeV. You can see they identified these resonances at 768 and 750 keV and 662 keV. Uh, the 662 keV was the lowest uh, resonance seen in previous experiments. Then there's some contamination, the shaded peaks uh, from carbon 12 and oxygen 16 but they did identify these uh, new resonances at 566 keV and 470 keV. On the right is a spectrum of the oxygen 18 lithium 6D reaction at 32 MeV. Again, there's some contamination from carbon 12 and oxygen 16. They observed the 662 keV resonance from previous works. And they identified these four new resonances at uh, 566 keV, 470 keV, 218, and uh, 58 keV. So then in a previous uh, separate experiment, they used a large germanium detector in close geometry with the target to try to measure the resonance strengths in the oxygen 18 alpha gamma reaction. They confirmed the earlier resonance strengths of trot better and co-authors above 600 keV. However, only upper limits for the strengths of the lower energy resonances could be obtained for the 566 and 470 keV. And the upper limits were um, 1.7 micro electron volts. Another attempt was made by Vogelar and co-authors to measure the low energy resonances. And they used a four pi array of sodium iodide detectors stacked symmetrically around the target and had additional equipment for background suppression. You can see the sum spectrum on the left here for the 662 keV resonance 
and the arrows indicate the summing region they used to create their yield curve shown on the right. And they confirm the earlier resonance strengths of trot better uh, above 600 keV. However, as with previous measurements, only upper limits for the strengths of low energy resonances could be obtained. So for the 566 keV resonance, an upper limit of less than or equal to two plus or minus 0 0.5 micro electron volts. And for the 470 keV resonance, an upper limit of less than or equal to zero plus or minus 0 0.2 micro electron volts. All right, so the last attempt to measure the low energy resonances was made by the Bhavna and co-authors. And they used a high efficiency segmented germanium detector in coincidence with BGO counters covering a large solid angle. You can see the experimental setup here with the clover and BGO detectors, the target, lead shielding, and plastic scintillators. They measured the partial resonance strengths for the 566 and 470 kV resonances. And then from those determined the total resonance strengths. So for the 566 kV resonance, a resonance strength of 0 0.71 plus or minus 0 0.17 microelectron volts. For the 470 kV resonance, a resonance strength of 0 0.48 plus or minus 0 0.16 microelectron volts. Those resonance strengths are very small and are supposedly the weakest alpha gamma resonances ever directly measured. The calculated reaction rate from that work is shown here on the right. And it's maybe a little hard to see everything, but the solid line is the total reaction rate. The smaller individual lines are the contributions from the individual resonances. So at higher temperatures above about 0 0.3 gigakelvin, the rate is determined by the 660 kV resonance and higher energy resonances. And then in the energy, uh, uh, in the range of temperatures relevant for the S process, so about 0 0.1 to 0 0.3 gigakelvin, the rate is dominated by the 566 kV resonance and especially the uh, 470 kV resonance. But again, they only measured uh, partial resonance strengths and then had to make assumptions in order to then determine the total resonance strength. So there's room for improvement. Okay, so this slide tries to summarize the previous slides and set the stage for the rest of the talk. So this slide shows the product of the Maxwell Boltzmann factor and the gamma factor, which represents uh, the probability of tunneling through the Coulomb barrier. And the product of these two, my mouse, there we go, sorry. The product of these two is the gamma peak. And from that, you can determine the gamma window. And thermonuclear reactions mainly occur uh, in this window. So this is for a temperature of 0 0.3 gigakelvin, which is the upper temperature relevant for S process nucleosynthesis. And I've shown here the five relevant resonances in the gamma window. So for example, these two resonances here are the ones that the bottom was able to measure partial resonance strengths for, and then uh, determine the total resonance strength. Now, as the temperature decreases to 0 0.2 gigakelvin, the 470 and 566 kV resonances become very important. And if you think in terms of the equation um, for the stellar reaction rate for isolated narrow resonances, the exponential term implies that uh, resonances with energies near KT will determine the reaction rate for a given stellar temperature. And for temperatures of stellar helium burning, the energies and strengths of the low energy resonances are therefore very important. In particular, the 470 kV resonances do, uh, resonance dominates this temperature range. So the rest of this presentation is about an experiment that was carried out to measure these five uh, resonance strengths 
with an emphasis on the two resonances uh, at 470 and 566 kV. So the 470 and 566 kV resonances are extremely weak. And therefore, you need to think about how to perform the experiment, how to decrease uh, beam induced background, environmental background, cosmic ray background, ultimately how to increase uh, signal to noise. Um, and so one idea would be to use inverse kinematics and detect the recoil. So on this type of experiment, a rel relatively heavy ion beam impinges on a light target, for example, a helium gas jet target. And uh, following alpha capture, the recoils will de-excite and will be contained in a kinematic cone with some opening uh, energy and momentum spread. Then you need to separate recoils from unreacted beam with um, many magnetic and electrostatic elements. And the advantage here is that you detect recoils rather than gamma rays, which allows the use of high efficiency, low noise particle detectors. And so this would be the approach adopted by the St. George recoil separator at the University of Notre Dame. Another approach would be to perform the experiment underground and uh, in addition, even possibly shield your detectors. So this is the approach adopted by Casper at SURF and for reasons I'll discuss later, the approach we used in the experiment I'll be showing. Um, so now I need to explain what uh, SURF and Casper are. SURF is the uh, uh, Sanford Underground Research Facility it's located in Leeds, South Dakota, and uses existing infrastructure of the former home state gold mine. It is the deepest underground laboratory in the United States. So up here is the surface, and then there are two shafts, the Yates shaft and the Ross shaft that take you 4,850 feet underground to the 4850 level. And that's where most of the research is being uh, research is performed. And there are a lot of experiments going on right now. Um, at this level, uh, it is equivalent to 4,300 meters, meter water equivalent of shielding. And that's based on a combination of the rock composition and depth. Uh, so what that basically means is that it is equivalent to having 4,300 meters of water of shielding above you. And that's a perfect environment for experiments like um, Lux LZ, that's searching for dark matter, or experiments like Majorana, looking for very rare processes like neutrinoless double beta decay, or uh, Ray Davis, who performed his Nobel Prize winning work on the solar neutrino problem in the 1960s. Um, so you arrive at SURF, um, you get your identification card and uh, brass tag, and uh, you put on all your prote uh, personal protective equipment. So um, you have a hard hat, safety glasses, a cap lamp um, that attaches to your hard hat, a battery for your cap lamp, which attaches to your utility belt. Um, also attaching to your utility belt is a W65 self-rescuer uh, that converts uh, toxic carbon monoxide to non-toxic carbon dioxide in case there's an underground fire or explosion. Uh, you get reflective clothing, which took the form of a high visibility vest and adequate footwear, which took the form of uh, steel toed shoes. So once you have your personal protective equipment, you get into the cage. Uh, the maximum amount of people can hold is 36 people. So it can be a little crammed sometimes. And then it's roughly a 10 minute ride to the bottom. So uh, two just little minor comments here. Um, first, if you go to surf in the middle of a global pandemic, you can add a couple of items to your personal protective equipment. Um, you have gloves, a face shield, a fitted respirator. Um, and then secondly, um, I've learned from experience that uh, sometimes it's hard to go underground when the facility is using dynamite to blast new spaces. This kind of complicates things a little bit uh, in terms of how you get underground. 
um, but we persevered. So uh, you get into the cage. Like I said, it's about a 10 minute ride to the bottom. It's sometimes uh, crowded, sometimes wet, sometimes cold, dark, and bumpy. But when you get to the bottom, uh, you get into a cart, and then it's a roughly a 10 minute ride over to Casper, which is located in this area. And um, Caspar is the compact accelerator system for performing astrophysical research. This is what it looks like in real life. And down here is a diagram. So there is a 1 million volt JN model Van de Graaff accelerator with a voltage range of 150 kilovolts to 1.1 million volts. And the RF ion source is capable of producing about 250 microamps of protons and 220 microamps of alpha particles. And then there's a one shot beam line to an analyzing magnet at 25 degrees. And then the beam is sent to the experimental end station. And from the experimental end station um, to the accelerator is about 16 meters, hence the word compact. So here's the experimental end station with the beam going this way in each of these uh, images. And Hector is the main device at the experimental end station, um, which I will discuss in a couple of slides. But um, slits were used to focus the beam on target. The targets were mounted in a target holder at 90 degrees with respect to the beam direction. You can see one of the targets here um, and the target holder without a target over here. Uh, direct water cooling was applied to all the targets uh, since we would be bombarding the targets with a high intensity beam for a long period of time. You can see the water cooling lines going through the back of Hector here and connecting to the target holder here. And then a liquid nitrogen uh, cooled inline copper tube part of which you can see here, uh, extended from the upstream direction to within about um, six millimeters of the target. And this served as a cold trap to prevent any carbon buildup on the target. And then a negative voltage was applied to the copper tube to suppress secondary electron emission. And then the target and the beam pipe served as a Faraday cup for measuring the integrated beam current on target. So a little more details about the targets. Um, tantalum pentoxide or Ta2O5 were made by anodizing tantalum backings in water. The uh, tantalum backings were approximately 1.5 inches by 1.5 inches by 0 0.5 millimeters thick and the water was enriched to 97% in oxygen 18. So for those unfamiliar with anodic oxidation, here's a little cartoon to illustrate it. Anodizing is obtained by passing a direct current through the water. And in these conditions, water dissociates and the positive H ions and the negative OH ions move toward the cathode and the anode respectively. Soon oxygen develops as O2 minus at the anode and reacts with tantalum as uh, tantalum five plus, which forms the uh, tantalum pentoxide layer on the surface. And this is what the target making setup looks like in reality. You have the anodizing power supply here, two multimeters for measuring the voltage and current and the anodizing cell here. Um, there are two tantalum backings on each side of the cell. They're connected to the power supply and then you can insert water into the cell. And there is a relationship between voltage and thickness of tantalum pentoxide, which is how we had a rough estimate for how thick our targets were. So for example, at um, 66 volts, you get a, uh, a target that is roughly 1,056 angstroms of tantalum pentoxide, that's yellow or golden color. At about 100 volts, 
you will get a target that's roughly 1600 angstroms of tantalum pentoxide that is blue or purple in color. And at 200 volts, you'll get a target that is roughly 3200 angstroms of tantalum pentoxide that is green in color. And most of the experiment was performed with the 66 volt target. Surrounding the target was Hector for gamma ray detection. So Hector stands for the high efficiency total absorption spectrometer. It is an array of 16 segments and each segment contains a sodium iodide crystal that's approximately four inches by eight inches by eight inches. There's one millimeter of aluminum casing surrounding each crystal and um, each segment contains two PMTs that are read out with the NSCL digital data acquisition. There's a 60 millimeter uh, diameter borehole that goes through the detector. And altogether, this is a large, highly efficient four pi detector. And uh, Hector is a total absorption spectrometer or summing detector. So I should explain the summing technique. And most people are familiar with a standard cobalt 60 source. So almost 100% of the time, cobalt 60 will beta decay to this excited state in nickel 60, which will then de-excite by emitting two sequential gamma rays. And in the sum spectrum shown here, these two gamma rays are summed together and produce a sum peak at the energy of the excited state. And of course, Hector isn't 100% efficient, so there are instances when only uh, one of the gamma rays is detected. Black is experiment and red is simulation using JON4 and there's very good agreement. Um, now consider a radiative capture reaction. And this is an example for an alpha gamma reaction. So there's a target nucleus with Z protons and A nucleons and that captures an alpha particle with some energy and that forms a compound nucleus in an excited state with an energy of the Q value plus the energy in the center of mass frame. The spectrum here shows the sum spectrum for a resonance in the oxygen 18 alpha gamma reaction that we measured with Hector at Caspar. Again, black is experiment and red is simulation using J on four. The number of counts in the sum peak is proportional to the number of counts, uh, excuse me, to the number of reactions that occurred. So we integrate the sum peak and then we can use J on four to estimate the summing efficiency. And from that, we know the yield, which we need for the resonance strength. But uh, real quickly, let me show you uh, the power or benefit of, of bringing Hector underground to Casper. So this is the sum spectrum of Hector for a room background taken at Notre Dame. And the y-axis are counts per 10 kV per second. Um, and there are some prominent features in this spectrum. Some of them are from the surrounding environment. So for example, the electron uh, capture decay of potassium 40 produces this sum peak at 1460 kV the beta minus decay of thallium 208 produces this sum peak at um, 2614 kV. And then after about three MeV, the thorium 228 decay chain ends. And then there are some other features beyond that. For example, there's a small peak here from the thermal neutron capture on sodium 23 or iodine 127 around um, 7,000 kV. And then all the counts here are from cosmic rays. Now compare that with a background run uh, taken uh, at Casper. The rate at lower energy is actually higher since you're surrounded by so much rock underground. But the higher energy background from cosmic rays completely disappears. And that's the benefit or power of bringing Hector to Casper because the Q value for the oxygen 18 alpha gamma reaction is about 9,666 kV. So depending on the beam energy, we can expect some peaks to appear uh, past this arrow. 
And um, if we use the um, 470 kV resonance strength by the Bhavna, one of the previous works as a guide, then if we put uh, 80 microamps of alpha beam on target, that's five times 10 to the 14 helium 41 plus particles per second for one hour and assume 15% uh, summing efficiency for Hector, then you will only see about 10 counts in the region of interest. And that's only for an hour. So convert that to counts per second to put on this plot. And you would never see anything above uh, or on top of the cosmic ray background. So with the low energy oxygen 18 alpha gamma resonances, uh, we're searching for a needle in a haystack and by bringing or using Hector at Casper, we removed the haystack. All right, so here are some results from the oxygen 18 alpha gamma reaction studied with Hector at Casper. And this is just meant to uh, sh demonstrate the analysis technique. And this is for the 750 kV resonance. So on the left is the sum spectrum. The blue histogram is an on resonance run and the red histogram is an off resonance run uh, to quantify the uh, non-resonant or direct capture process, which you can see is uh, pretty small. The dotted histogram is the result of subtracting the off resonance run from the on resonance run. And then that dotted histogram is then fit with a Gaussian and a linear background in red, which is decomposed into uh, a Gaussian and a linear background in pink. And I subtract the linear background, which results in that cyan histogram, and then integrate the cyan histogram to determine the number of counts in the sum peak. But I still have to correct for the summing efficiency of Hector. So I gate on this sum peak and look at the number of segments of Hector that detected energy. And that's the spectrum here on the right. And from that spectrum, I can determine uh, the average segment multiplicity. So we use that information and j 4 to estimate the summing efficiency. And so all these figures here are from j 4 simulations. And the figure on the left shows the average segment multiplicity as a function of average cascade multiplicity for different total energies. So as you expect, the number of segments firing increases as the cascade multiplicity increases. And then the figure on the right shows the summing efficiency as a function of average segment multiplicity. So if you think about the previous slide, I know the total energy and the average segment multiplicity. And from a plot like this, I can read off the efficiency, the summing efficiency. So I have the yield that's corrected for the summing efficiency, the de Broglie wavelength, which can be calculated. Um, I can use SHRIM to determine the effective stopping power of the target. And with that, I can solve for the resonance strength. So this is the yield curve for the oxygen 18 alpha gamma reaction. And the x-axis is in terms of the analyzing magnet at Casper. So I've tried to um, indicate all the front edges of the five resonances that we measured. But there is a plateau and a front edge for each of these resonances. And the plateau here is actually a combined plateau for the 750 and 770 kV resonances. And the numbers on the right give you an idea of the beam intensity we used while scanning each resonance. So we used about 20 to 50 microamps to scan the 750 and 770 kV resonances, around 60 to 70 microamps to scan the 662 kV resonance, around 80 to 140 microamps to scan the 566 kV, uh, the 566 and 470 kV resonances. And just to give you an idea, the total amount of time we sat at one energy uh, for, on the plateau of the 470 kV resonance for the thick target yield was about 12 hours, which gave in total about uh, 120 counts or so. Um, 
since the beam intensity was relatively high for a relatively long amount of time to collect enough statistics, one concern is target degradation. So to check for target uh, stability and target degradation, we used the 334 kV resonance in oxygen 18 P gamma. So we would scan this resonance before we used a target. And those are the uh, blue circles. So the amount of uh, charge it uh, takes to perform a scan is about 0 0.03 coulombs. Then after we use the target during the actual oxygen 18 alpha gamma resonance scans, we would scan this resonance again. And those are the orange squares. And you can see that after accumulating about 1.63 coulombs, the full width at half maximum is unchanged and the maximum yield is also unchanged, indicating there's no target, target degradation. Another thing um, that was done to check for target stability and degradation was when recording the thick target yield, uh, I recorded the data in one hour chunks. And so this allowed me to monitor the yield as a function of accumulated charge. And you can see that here for the 470 and 566 kV resonances, the yield is constant, uh, which is good. So this brings me now to the resonance strength results and um, comparison to the previous measurements. And this is for the 767 kV resonance. And the plot on the left is a reminder of which resonance I'm referring to. And the table shows the actual values with the, um, the present work having asymmetric error bars. And so for this resonance, uh, there is a discrepancy between the present work and the previous measurement by Vogelar. And um, so here's one possible explanation for that discrepancy. I can gate on the sum peak for this resonance and look at the energy deposited in the individual segments of Hector. Um, so this spectrum is sensitive to the individual gamma rays in the gamma ray cascades from this resonance. And that is the spectrum shown here in black. Then uh, Vogelar determined branching ratios for this resonance. And so I can use those branching ratios and create the same spectrum in simulation, which is the dashed red uh, spectrum. And you can see that there's not uh, good agreement. So the analysis that determined these incorrect branching ratios also determined uh, that discrepant uh, resonance strength which may explain uh, the discrepancy. For the 750 kV resonance, uh, that's this one here, there's a spread in the resonance strength values. However, the result from the present work is in agreement um, with the previous measurement um, by Vogelar. For the 662 kV resonance, um, there is very good agreement with the result from Hector and all the previous measurements. They're all within the uncertainty of each other. For the 566 kV resonance, the result with Hector is consistent with the upper limit placed by Vogelar and Giesen. Um, and it is also consistent with the value from the Bhavna. However, uh, the uncertainty is larger for this one which is due to the statistics uh, for this particular resonance. But for the 470 kV resonance, the uh, result with Hector is consistent with the upper limit placed by uh, Vogelar and Giesen. It's also consistent with the value by Dababna. However, the uncertainty is smaller. So, um, the oxygen 18 alpha gamma reaction is part of a reaction chain that produces the neon 22 alpha n neutron source for the slow neutron capture process. Um, however, the uh, astrophysically relevant resonances in this reaction are difficult to measure due to their small resonance strengths. So an experiment optimized for background suppression and detection efficiency 
was recently performed to measure the resonance strengths of these low energy resonances using Hector at Caspar at, at SURF. And now uh, what needs to be done is look at the impact of these new resonance strength measurements on the oxygen 18 alpha gamma reaction rate. And so I'd like to um, thank all of the collaborate, collaborators here from the University of Notre Dame, UND, and uh, South Dakota School of Mines and Technology, a special, uh, especially uh, and a special thanks to uh, Dan Robertson from University of Notre Dame and um, two graduate students from the South Dakota School of Mines and Technology, Mark Hanhart and Tom Kavlicek. And then uh, thanks to all of you for all of your attention. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Alexander. Uh, so um, it is now time for questions. Uh, so questions, please. Um, I do not see hands. So, okay, I see one. So uh, Artemis, please go ahead. Hey, Alex, that was a very nice talk. Um, I was just curious, you showed in that one resonance the, the discrepancy with the previous measurement and you showed the segments and how they are different. So that would indeed explain, uh, you know, a, a potential difference. But since you have the red simulation there, did you try to get a, an efficiency from that kind of a fake efficiency and see how that would affect the result? That's um, that's on the to-do list. Yeah, if I can use, if there's some mention in uh, Vogelar of the branching ratios that he used, uh, or how he determined his resonance strength from those branching ratios, if so, these branching ratios have been updated since then. Um, if I could use the updated branching ratios and see. Um, use that to calculate a new resonance strength uh, from Vogelar, that, uh, that's something um, to do, yeah. Okay, uh, other questions? Well, well, uh, people are thinking about that. Uh, let me ask uh, another question. So let's, um, do you think it is possible that uh, there are resonances at lower energies, uh, below 460, uh, that may contribute? Is that a possibility still? Um, so we didn't, um, let me go back to a slide, but while I'm going there, uh, we didn't go push lower in energy than the 470 kV uh, resonance, but, um, from Giesen, there's indication that these reson there are resonances at 218 and 58 kV. However, um, those the resonance strengths that uh, Giesen estimated for them are very very small. So it's um, if I remember correctly, it's 10 to the minus 40 microelectron volts and 10 to the minus 12 microelectron volts for these two. And so they don't contribute to the uh, reaction rate. So the, they're two outside of the gamma window, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, I see. Okay, thank you. And we have another question. Uh, Philip, please go ahead. Hi, can you just go back to the, uh, the yield curve against the energy? Um, It's, it's, it's always in a bad location every time I ask someone to go to a slide. <laughs> this one? Uh, yes, that one. I, I was just wondering what, what what's happening at the, the lower energies? Because there's a kind of drop in the middle and then it, it comes back. It's kind of got a weird shape. Uh, Can you, I, I don't really know what that is. So, um, so we didn't unfortunately get some uh, a chance to fill in this gap, but it's basically the front edge uh, plateau and then you would drop off and then the front edge of the next resonance. Ah, uh, okay, okay. So it's just it's just from where you've measured and where the resonance location is, there's a kind of a hole in the middle that's missing. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Okay, cool, thanks. 
Okay, uh, the, there is a question in chat from uh, Hishani, um, and she's asking uh, uh, if you have a, an estimate on how the uncertainties in the stream stopping tables would affect the uh, extraction of the resonance strings from the yields. Can you comment on that? So in terms of the uncertainty, um, so the total uncertainty, there's, uh, there are three, three factors that go into the total uncertainty. So there's the statistical uncertainty in the yield uh, that's from integrating the sum peak and subtracting the linear background. There's um, an uncertainty in the summing efficiency, and that usually is about eight to ten percent. And then the um, and that's usually one of the dominant uh, forms of the uh, factors in the uncertainty. And then for the stopping power, the effective stopping power, uh, the uncertainty there um, is five percent. That seems to be a standard uh, convention in the literature to use 5%. I don't know if that's the answer to the question, but. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I think it does. Okay. Are there any other questions? Okay, I see another one in chat. Uh, so uh, Vlad Goldberg is asking a technical question. Um, Oh, so Vlad, maybe you can unmute yourself and ask the question. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. I'm so So you see, I am so sorry. I missed part of your talk, the most interesting, I believe, because of problems with internet. So my question is about, it's some technical question. So have you used fast coincidence to define the moment of interaction. Have I, sorry, what was, have I used what? Fast coincidence, some kind of fast coincidence. Um, no, the, so the, in terms of the, uh, so we have built events in software and that event window is uh, 100 nanoseconds. But um, no, we don't have any coincidence logic or anything. Thank you. That... You see, I, I mean that if you use a cyclotron or some some accelerator, we give you pulse beam, you can have fast coincidence where probably with two nanoseconds time, something like this to discriminate from background. Right. Um, so for there though, I would imagine you would use that maybe to reduce like uh, the environmental background or cosmic ray background. Um, and with that reaction uh, with the present work, um, we don't, have any of that background, so. Have you had any neutrons which could produce some gamma rays around your detector? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. So with uh, thermal neutron capture on uh, either the sodium or iodine and of the sodium iodide crystal, um, that will produce a uh, peak at around seven MeV, so that's below the region of interest. Um, and then in terms of the oxygen 18 alpha N reaction, we're below that threshold energy. So we wouldn't have neutrons from that reaction. Thank you. Uh, we, we actually have another question. So uh, Bertis Rasko, please, Bertis. Uh, hey, uh, nice talk. Um, so how low does that red line actually go that you just showed for the, because um, there's still some structure at 5,000. Yeah, what, how low does it, really go <laughs> um by low do you mean like uh the count rate or yeah or uh like the graph seems cut off at six thousand by stopping it at 10 to the minus two and a half oh uh this is real this is the true uh cut off i'm not uh, yeah yeah so it just it just plummets to zero at that point yes yep 
And this is actually interesting. Um, this, so this little region here, uh, from what I've found in the literature, and I can discuss this more if you want, but this is actually the internal contamination of the sodium iodide crystal itself. <laughs> Yeah, it's ridiculous how small you can see, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, that you will only really be able to notice that if you're underground. Cool. Thank. Yeah. So it really does go to zero. That's what I was wondering. If it just, if it, I mean, if you just. Yeah, I know it's on log scale, it. but there's, there's nothing past uh, this little bump. Okay. Okay. Thanks. So um, we are uh, nearing the allocated uh, one hour. Uh, so unless there are no other urgent questions, well, let's uh, thank the speaker. It was wonderful talk and very interesting and informative, Alexander. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, okay, uh, at this point, we actually conclude uh, our uh, preview uh, series uh, for this season. And uh, so uh, I hope to see you um, next season uh, in the fall. Uh, thank you. Uh, everyone, and uh, thank you for participating and attending today. Thank you. Goodbye.